I've been reminded this week that he doesn't have to come. We can ask, and rightfully so, but he doesn't have to show up. He shows up because he wants to. Amen? He shows up because he wants us to know him, to know that there is a God who is real. There's a God who cares. There's a God who answers prayer. There's a God who is personal, approachable, full of love, full of compassion. He shows up so that we can know him. Amen? If we just feel good, feel goosebumps, shout, dance, cry, and go home without experiencing him, encountering him, hearing him, we've missed a little bit. But if we experience him, if we experience his compassion, we live here changed. And then we go out and we are the salt and the light. Does our nation need light? I don't know if you know. Does our nation need light? Our nation needs light. Our nation needs the salt of God's presence, of God's goodness. And you and I have been equipped by the Holy Spirit to be that. Amen? And so over the next few moments, let's listen to what he says. Because he's the one who has everything that we need in this room today. We're going to be continuing in our series, He Still Heals. He being Jesus. And Pastor Andrew opened up wonderfully for us last week, touching on different areas of healing, different areas of God's intervention. And as we go today, the sermon title is Heaven on Earth. And that's because when Jesus came and he healed the sick and he raised the dead and he cast out demons, he was replicating on earth the nature, the character, the attributes that are in heaven. He was showing us on earth what it's like in heaven. Have you ever been to a funeral and you hear a Christian funeral, if I be specific, and you hear how they are in heaven now, there's no more tears there, there's no more sorrow, there's no more sadness. Have we heard something like that? Why is that? Because where God is, there's life. And anything that's aside from life does not exist there. And so Jesus came and he said, hey, I want you to start tasting heaven. I want you to start preparing because this world, this fallen world is not how it was meant to be. Let me give you a taster of heaven on earth. And so it begins with his presence. It begins with his presence. Where he is, that's heaven. He is heaven represented on earth. And so as we uncover his word, as we discover, as we explore, as we enjoy his presence, if you are in this room and you need healing, reach out first and foremost in your heart and touch him. Because he is the healer. We're saying he still heals because he did not stay in the grave. He died, he did. But three days later, death had to let him go. The grave had to let him go because they could not hold life. And likewise today, sickness has to let us go because he is here and because he lives in us as his children. We're going to look at the story of two people. One is called Lazarus. No, Jairus, Jairus, and Jairus is a ruler of a synagogue. 2,000 years ago, synagogues were ran, there were, there were synagogues and then there was the temple. Synagogues had the local leaders who would oversee the running of the worship, and so he is one of them, and he was in a little bit of trouble. So let us read together and see what was going on in his life. Let's read the book of Luke, chapter 8. Verse 40 begins. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him. 
for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied, Peter said, Master, the crowd surrounds you, and they are pressing on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. For I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. To the ruler who had started that conversation, who had stopped Jesus, who had been desperate to get to Jesus, had gotten to Jesus, he had become very hopeful, and now he finds out his daughter is dead. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, Jesus came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter, John, and James, and the father and the mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her, but he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned. And she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given to her to eat. And the parents were amazed. The parents were amazed because just one moment ago, their daughter was dead. The next moment, the daughter is alive. Now, that miracle is written there, not just for us to read and think, wow, that's amazing. But it's written for us to know how to access heaven on earth. Tell someone next to you, access heaven on earth. The ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, we can call him and we can see him as a perplexed father, as a desperate father. His only daughter in the bed, sick, I was going to say in hospital, but you and I can imagine, if that was our day and age, that child would be in hospital. Pediatrics unit, ICU, all the doctors on board checking what's going on. Heart rate, blood pressure, what can we do? And all of them are saying, I'm really sorry, but you need to prepare for the worst. One of the books in the Bible, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about this story. One of them says, he went to Jesus and said, my daughter is dead. The other one says, my daughter is dying. And I think one of the differences is because when someone is in such a bad state, sometimes it's like we know unless there's an intervention, they are dead. And so we are right at the end of this daughter in her last breath. He has pushed past all the things in his mind because he's thinking to himself, I'm a ruler in a synagogue. Synagogues did not really like Jesus at that time. Do you remember that? They didn't like this man who's coming and causing a bit of a shuffle, and he's talking about himself being the son of God, and he's healing people on a Sabbath day. We should be resting. We shouldn't be healing people. They didn't like him. So when he's going to Jesus, he's actually saying, I might be losing my job, but I've got to get to Jesus. I might be losing my credentials, but I must, I must get to Jesus. 
it's going to cost me everything, but I've got to get this daughter well. And the only person who I think can do it is Jesus. And so he's pushed past all his thoughts, all his doubts. He's counted his cost and he's decided it's going to be worth it if there's any chance that Jesus can save, can heal, can bring back my daughter. I want you to see him because he's pushed past the crowd. Remember we read at the start, there's a crowd. They're all excited to see Jesus. Do you know why they're excited? Because Jesus had been in Galilee before. Galilee was a place where he turned water into wine. So news had spread about him. That's why Jairus and that's why the woman we'll talk about as well are here. Because they had heard. Say heard. Because that's very important, what we hear. They had heard about Jesus. And so they've pushed, they've run, they've gone. He gets to Jesus. (sighs) Ah, there's hope. My daughter is going to be well. And then he's rudely interrupted. I think he's rudely interrupted because just as he's having this really deep conversation with Jesus, my daughter is dead, come quickly, and woman comes in the way. Now, in those days, a woman was considered more than second class. A woman comes in the way. An unclean woman comes in the way. She doesn't come face to Jesus. She touches his garment, disrupts the attention of Jesus. Jesus has to stop talking to the man to pay attention to who touched him. And now the man is thinking, okay, this Jesus, why do you care who touched you? Come with me. I'm telling you, my daughter's dying. But Jesus follows the woman in terms of where is she? Who is this that touched me? Unlike the man who has a daughter, pediatric, probably something sudden has gone on, something desperate has gone on. The woman has been sick for 12 years. The woman has been hemorrhaging for 12 years. 12 years of bleeding every day leaves you anemic. It leaves you lethargic. It leaves you depressed. It leaves you lonely. Because you just don't have the energy to do anything. Add on to that the fact that in their culture, if you are, as this woman was, bleeding for 12 years, you're cast out. As if it wasn't bad enough, she's now has no, she now has no friends. No one can touch her. Anyone who comes to her, she has to shout, unclean, unclean, for her to be spaced out between her and people. She hasn't known what a hug is in 12 years. She probably hasn't known a handshake in 12 years. She has no friends, no family. She's in a desperate situation. So we can see why she interrupts Jesus as well. She's counted her cost. Because if they find out who she is, she'll be in big trouble. Because she's not meant to touch anybody. Anybody who she touches has to separate themselves for seven days. Imagine just a couple of years ago, Anybody who coughed in the room meant that we all had to separate for seven days. Do you remember that? That's what was happening here. But she's desperate, and she touches the hem, but she's healed. She's healed. Immediately, she's healed. And she's healed not only in her body, which is important, but Jesus tells her, daughter, Daughter, someone who hasn't had, heard the father's love, anybody's love for 12 years. Daughter, anybody who came across her would have shouted at her, unclean. And now this person is saying, daughter. She's being restored. Pastor Claudette was praying about restoration of the soul today. She's being restored as she hears Jesus telling her, You're not unclean, you're daughter. You're not outside of the family, you belong to the family. She is receiving not only physical healing, but everything that she lost, everything that the doctors had taken. She is now receiving a whole new restoration. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. And she goes off. Now, why had she touched Jesus? Because she heard of what he had done. Turning water into wine. 
She had heard about four men who had left everything to follow him. That was in Galilee as well. Peter and Andrew left everything to follow this Jesus. She had heard about somebody else who had a son. The royal son is called, who had been healed. She had heard and she had followed. But not only what she had heard, but what she was hearing in here. Because what we hear in our ears has to go into our heart. If it stays in our head, we're not going to touch Jesus. Because we have to count the cost and say, I'm going to touch him regardless of how much it costs me. She had heard the gospel. She had heard Jesus heals. And she had heard it in her heart. If I just touch his garment, I will be healed. And secondly, she had seen. Because when she heard that voice in her heart, she began to see, I will be healed. I will be healed. I will be healed. And with every step, I will be healed. If anyone sees me, I'm going to be in trouble. But I'm going to take the risk because I will be healed. Let us be encouraged today. Hear what Jesus is doing. But allow it to keep repeating in your mind until it gets to your heart. Allow it to get into the heart until it forms an image of your life healed, of our lives transformed by the presence of Jesus. Amen? Now remember, we didn't start with her. We started with Jairus. Jairus had begged Jesus. I'm not making those words up. It says he begged Jesus to heal. He's pleading, come, come quickly, heal. Heal my daughter, follow me. I'll show you the way. And yet this lady comes, touches Jesus. No begging, no hassle. She's healed, gone. What do you feel? What do I feel? It's like when someone comes and prays for the same thing you're praying for. Their prayers get answered just like that. And you're left standing thinking, I've been fasting, I've been praying, I've called the prayer of three, I've called the pastors, and this one just came and got healed. Does anybody identify with that? He's probably perplexed. He's like, what's going on here? And before he gets disappointed, before he gives up, Jesus speaks to him and says, hey, do not fear, only believe. Tell your neighbor, only believe. Do not fear. Because he had feared, I've lost my daughter, that's it, it's over, she's dead. Jesus has healed this other person. It was quick. Maybe it's not going to happen to me because if it was going to happen to me, it would have been as quick as this. I would not have had to beg. But Jesus heals just like that, turns around, tells him, do not fear, only believe, and goes with him. And when they get into the house, we meet a few other people. We meet professional mourners. Because in those days, if somebody died, well, nearing death, they'd start to call them, hey, we're going to have a funeral here. And they were professional, and they would come. And I'm feeling like some of us here come from cultures where we know about professional mourners, because we're going to call this certain group, usually women, who are going to have the high-pitched, higher than Rosemond, kind of, you know, and they're going to be wailing and crying and mourning so that the whole neighborhood can know that there has been a death in the family. Jesus meets the professional mourners. And Jesus meets the mockers. The mourners are professional. And I think that's important. Because in today's age, we don't have professional mourners per se. But we've got professional Google telling us, hey, if you've got this condition, this is how this ends. We've got professional opinion, and I'm not saying don't listen to it. But what I'm saying is Jesus has the final say. We've got the professional opinion. We've got professional YouTube. Because, you know, after Google, we go to YouTube or whichever other place to find out, okay, what do I do about this? 
we've got our professional social media because we I have a lovely, lovely, lovely grandma who I need to tell that everyone who says is a doctor on YouTube is not a doctor. But we've got the professionals telling us all sorts, but we also have the mockers. Why are you believing in Jesus? Why are you listening to him? Look, if he was going to heal you, he would have done it already. But do you know what Jesus does? Jesus, not Jairus, pushes them all out of the house. Why is it that Jesus does that? I think it's because Jesus is the word the word became flesh, remember? The word dwelt among men. And it's Jesus' word in us. We are a house. We are a temple. It's Jesus' word in us that pushes out the sound that is not in alignment with his word. If we're wrestling to have faith, if we're le- wrestling to believe, Jesus says only believe, be encouraged. Read the word of God. Increase the word in your life. Let us increase the reading of the word in our hearts because the word is what pushes out the mockers. The word is what pushes out the professional mourners. The word is what says only believe, only believe. From the moment Jesus says only believe until the daughter is healed, we do not hear Jairus speak. We only hear Jesus speak. When you hear that word of God, hold on to it and allow it to lead you. Only believe. Only believe. I'm walking to my house. There's mourners crying because they're saying my daughter's dead. But Jesus said, only believe. So I'm going to only believe. And because of what he had heard, Jesus did. What he had seen in his heart. Because he also said, if you touch my daughter she will be well. The woman had said, if I touch him, I will be well. What is the vision that we have of what God is going to do in our lives? What is the image, imagination that we have once Jesus touches us, once we touch Jesus? Because we are being shown here that he can touch us and we can touch him. We don't have to wait for him. We can be like the woman who says, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to reach out and touch him. And sometimes in the middle of worship or in the middle of the word or in the middle of your life, he can just come and touch both of them. It's his presence that makes the difference. Amen. Both of them, once we connect with him, heaven, him invades earth. He transforms what's going on on earth. What we hear, what we see, and our response. Because if we hear and we see, but we don't do anything about it, then it remains a seed, but it's not growing, it's not producing fruit. The woman hears, she sees it in her heart, but she doesn't stop there, she reaches out. Jairus hears what Jesus does, He sees it. My daughter will be well. He doesn't stop there. He goes to Jesus, risking it all, but it's worth it if I just connect with Jesus. Be encouraged today. Jesus is the one who heals. All of us are but instruments in his hands. Yes, connect to your sister in Christ and pray together. But it's not her or him who heals. It's Jesus connecting to that prayer. And we are being called to not only believe for our healing, but to be the ones through whom Jesus heals the world around us. Because there are men and women walking with diseases that just fled when Jesus came into sight. There is nothing. There is no sickness. There is no disease that has power or that has authority over Jesus. Every disease, every sickness, every disorder must bow. Amen. I was looking up the definition of disease. I thought, let me excite myself. Disease is a disorder of structure or function. Disorder. Usually we attribute it to the body. But it can apply to anything, because anything can be out of order. 
So when we look at this woman, it might be we don't need healing of the body, but how's our family doing? Because Jesus saved and restored these families. If their daughter came back to life, and she did, that family was never the same again. That woman being restored to our community, that life was never the same again. He healed not only her physical body, he healed her soul, their soul, both of them. He healed their spirit. When we read in the Bible, Jesus calling someone son or daughter, it's actually talking about salvation as well. It's about being brought back into the family of God. He healed their families. He healed their finances. Remember the woman had nothing because she had paid it all to try and get help. Now she was going to be able to go to work. Now she was going to be accepted. She was going to be able to earn a living. The healing was over everything in her life. Jesus is willing to heal everything in our lives. I pray that our faith is being lifted up to see the impossibilities, the impossibilities in our life made possible. I pray that our faith is being stirred up to believe that if he did it for her, he can do it for me. When I was reading this, I thought, could Jairus have felt a bit salty about this woman being healed? And then I thought, how many times we feel bitter, envious, jealous, angry when someone's prayers are answered before us? Am I the only one confessing? Okay. We repent after that, and we learn to not be like the son who... Um, who got upset when the, the son, when the prodigal son came home. But Jesus was showing us that, hey, I have more than enough for everyone. I have more than enough for all of you. And if he comes in, when his presence is here, he's not limited to here only. He's going to be able to heal everything and everyone in the surrounding. We just have to reach out to him. Amen. So what we hear is important. What we see is important. And our response is important. We have to make Jesus our aim. Jesus our aim. Not a person. Jesus is the healer. And we have to secondly, only believe. Will fear come? Yes, if fear wasn't going to come, Jesus would not have said, do not fear. But he was saying, hey, don't accept that. Fear is trying to come, but don't accept that. Only believe. Remember what you heard. Remember what, what had happened to other people before you. Because that means it can happen to you and for you. Only believe in his word.